Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Piancy. I'm joined, as usual, by my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. How are you, Cass? I'm good. Busy. Um, we're joined by our special guest, as usual, uh, Mike Burgersberg, Dirty Bubble Media. James, how are you? I'm doing great, guys. Today's been a very fun day. Well, let's talk about why today and yesterday have been kind of bombshells uh, for the entire industry. Uh, let's, and to be clear, I don't think, I think all of us maybe saw this coming. So it's not exactly surprising news, but it is, it, it is bombshells nonetheless. So uh, Mike Bennett, I don't know which one of you wants to take it away, but let's start with Binance. Well, uh, it turns out that Binance was doing some things that maybe weren't legal and uh, the SEC has something to say about it. And they finally released a uh, motion or a, 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 ju a, a filing that basically tells us that the SEC is going to smash Binance into tiny pieces if they have their way. Yeah. So for uh, just a touch more context, yesterday, Monday, June 5th, the SEC filed a complaint against the SEC with 13 separate um, violations alleging a variety of things that they offered and sold unregistered securities, including both uh, BUSD, BNB, BNB Vault, their staking program, their earn program, and a bunch of other tokens they were trading, that they did a whole bunch of wash trading using Chang Penzao controlled market makers, that they failed to register as a securities exchange, which, yeah, no shit, it's not like they were ever going to register. And what I think was really interesting is if you go all the way back to episode 23 of Crypto Critics Corner, we talked about the Forbes reporting on the Tai Chi documents. And the Tai Chi documents were a plan concocted by a consultant that Binance hired that suggested if they wanted to minimize their risk from regulators, their best tactic would be to create a U.S.-based entity which would license software from Binance, pass its trading fees back as those licensing fees, that there would be affiliated market makers that would share liquidity between the two entities, and that this entity would pretend to be regulated, attracting the attention of regulators, and hopefully gaining them permissiveness for some of their past violations. And I think what is going to be the most important thing to go through as we talk about this complaint here is that the reporting from Forbes about the Tai Chi documents was entirely confirmed by this SEC complaint. We should also mention that like this SEC complaint echoes a lot of the same things we talked about a month and a half ago when the CFTC complaint against Binance came out. But it really, altogether, confirms that reporting and shows Binance tried to use Binance US as a shield from regulatory pressure. The crypto uh, market and the crypto believers, I think they really missed the significance of Binance US. Because when people like us were talking about a few months ago, they said, well, it's just this tiny little exchange. I mean, relative to Binance, it's, it's, you know, it's nothing. And they thought, well, it's a separate company. So if they get in trouble, it doesn't matter. It's this, you know, little problem that, that will just go away and it won't cause any issue for Binance. But actually what it's done is it's opened Binance up to federal regulators of every kind because they were doing business in the United States. And the evidence is quite clear that it was nothing more than an extension of Binance. It was never a separate company. Yeah. And there was a lot of evidence like pointing directly to that. They had a quote from Binance's former chief compliance officer saying, we do not want Binance.com to be regulated ever. Uh, they talked about like how at the surface, we cannot be seen to have U.S. users, but in reality, we should get them through other creative means. Cheng Pen Zhao was a signatory on these Binance U.S. bank accounts as of last month. Binance custodied all of the crypto for Binance US up until at least December 2022, and at least some of it, the SEC was able to confirm as of last month. All of the trading activity was done on Binance's system, and Binance's market surveillance team was not checking for wash trading front running or anything like that on Binance US. Plus, we can get into it, and I think this is going to be an important part of this, there was a bunch of irregular transfers. The these were the potentially more justifiable ones, which is that Cheng Pen Zhao and Binance were using Merit Peak, a Cheng Pen Zhao owned market maker, as an intermediary for BUSD. So they claim that when customers wanted BUSD, they would transfer the money out of Binance or Binance US to Merit Peak. Merit Peak would transfer it to Paxos. Paxos would send them BUSD. Merit Peak would send it back to Binance or Binance US, and then the customer would get their BUSD. However, 
this was not disclosed to clients. Clients did not know their funds were being transferred to an Cheng Pen Zhao owned market maker. And one of the other market makers, Sigma Chain, the one responsible for more of the wash trading than Merit Peak, also was receiving irregular transfers from both Binance and Binance US, some of which reportedly went to purchase an $11 million yacht. But this actually brings me to today's news in regard to Binance, which was kind of a very specific um, freezing of assets request from the SEC. Uh, And as far as I understand, it was that they are freezing these assets on behalf of customers. So the customers can still withdraw their funds from Binance, Binance US, but they want to keep these funds out of the hands of CZ and the rest of Binance International because of what you're specifically bringing up right now. Yes, yeah, and this was actually included as part of the complaint in the prayer for relief at the very bottom that um that, like a lot of the things that were described in the proposed order filed today were mentioned in there. This is just the text they hope the court will approve and then will be enacted. But as you mentioned, what's interesting about this is they're seeking this freeze on Binance assets, but there's a specific exemption to allow them to still be able to handle customer withdrawals and everything like that. And so there's kind of this suggestion with the SEC seeking this relief. They haven't sought in any other case in cryptocurrency that I can remember at the very least. It seems to be worries that funds have been misappropriated. We talked about on here before, like there have been issues with Binance accounting that might lead people to worry about that. When the BPEG tokens were unbacked, when Binance PEG BUSD was unbacked, all of these things raise concerns about the quality of Binance accounting and what that means for customer assets. And so the SEC seeking, like you mentioned, this very specific relief really kind of accentuates that. Yeah. And I mean, I would mention that, you know, one of the reasons that I became interested in Binance US was discovering that there were billions of dollars in crypto transfers between Binance US and Binance through a pair of really strange wallets that literally only existed to make those transfers. And that at one point, or at least one point, if not multiple points, uh, customer withdrawals could not be paid out of Binance US without making corresponding transfers from Binance before continuing those transfers. So there's a serious concern that customer assets already have been misappropriated and are not even in Binance US's control, whatever that even means. Yes. And one other thing that I want to highlight that you've repeatedly discussed in your reporting and your work is some of the payments processors, banks, and entities like that, that Binance US has had to rely on. And the SEC talked about how in the Tai Chi papers, there was a desire to use Binance US for its functional fiat capacity, which seemed to imply that Binance (laughs) US was intended to be used as kind of like this face that would allow them access to the United States banking system, to these financial services and stuff like that. And so I think this really confirms like the importance of some of the stuff you've been highlighting there in terms of like who Binance US has been working with. Right. I mean, that's exactly that's exactly the point, right? Like these guys are not people you want having access to the banking system. And they've had to use all sorts of clever workarounds for years. You know, the the SEC complaint specifically mentions the Key, De- Key Vision Development Limited, which is a Seychelles-based shell corporation that Binance used for years to access the U.S. banking system and, you know, only recently lost access after the collapse of Signature and uh, uh, Silvergate banks. Um, but they've been able to use Binance U.S. and it looks like potentially that's been their lifeline. So if they manage to freeze these accounts and cut them off that way, I don't think they have any access left. And that's a very interesting position to be in for a company that holds an unknown billion number of billions of dollars of assets of a lot of people who live in the United States and are, you know, companies are based in the United States. Yes, yes, exactly. And it's just so reminiscent of how FTX and Alameda Research were using its network of like global OTC desks in order to try to maintain access to the banking system, like directly with Alameda Research in the way that everyone is familiar with, but also like around the globe with Genesis Block in Hong Kong, with uh, Hivex in Australia. My God, I've been covered. I, I, whoo! That was bad that I forgot that one. Uh, Or some of the other ones like in the United Arab Emirates or things like that. 
It's the same strategy that we saw all the way back with Crypto Capital Core in 2017, 2018, and whatever, setting up a variety of shells in different jurisdictions mm. in the hope that you can gain access to the banking system under false pretenses in order to make sure that the businesses that rely on you, these major cryptocurrency exchanges, don't lose access to these fiat rails. And, and going to that point about Alameda and FTX, you know, I'm reading this complaint and um, – the SEC is specifically referring to how Merit Peak, which again, these are all supposed to be separate companies, right? Like Merit Peak is a market maker. It's not supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be a separate entity from Binance, right? At least in theory. And yet it looks like they're the ones receiving like $22 billion, a lot of which is customer assets directly from this key vision development. So in other words, these bank transfers are not being made directly to Binance. They're going through intermediary parties. It's It literally is. It's the same model. It's the same model as FTX and Alameda, where Alameda was the one receiving all of the customer assets, and then would they would like credit Binance or credit FTX with the money, but never actually sent it. And you know, I can't say that's what's happened here, um, but certainly there should be concern that at least some of that money may not have gotten to where it should have. And I guess we're going to find out. I think this brings up. I I know we're we're not gonna. I I think it's not it's uncouth to discuss it at length or at least to try to predict anything. But I do think there's, from what we've seen from these SEC actions, it appears as though there's a lot of room here for possible criminal criminal charges to be brought. And I'm, I'm just curious if you guys feel like that's the other shoe that everyone is waiting for it to drop. Or if, if Bennett, I know we discussed MLARs before and how Binance had hired somebody from MLARS to work with them. Um, do we think that's still in the works, that, that this is something that they're going to get get out of? Mike, I'd like to hear your answer first, because I've got a bit of a rant on this one. Um, I mean, I probably do too, unfortunately. Um, I mean, I look at it this way, right? Like, a civil agency is probably more inclined to settle than a criminal agency, right? Like, they have fewer means to enforce their actions. Um so if the fact that both the CFTC and SEC come out and tell you they're going to sue these guys and they use the kind of language they're using in their in their complaints that is incredibly I mean re, I mean it's fiery language right for like a for like a lawyers I mean it's like they're accusing them basically of being criminals in these civil complaints they they have access to their phones they have access to private chats and that doesn't happen when you're a civil agency so clearly somebody's giving them all of this information they didn't get it by themselves. Um, so, yeah, I've been waiting for that shoe to drop for a while, and uh, I think it will be, but you never know. So the third sentence in Binance's response to the SEC is, most recently we have, ex we have engaged in extensive good faith discussions to reach a negotiated settlement to resolve their investigations, meaning the SEC in this case. Cass, as you and I have talked about, like, in our episode, Fuck the SEC, uh, the SEC loves negotiated settlements. It's their favorite thing. They get to go into Congress and say, we closed this many cases and got this crazy number of dollars and all the problems are dealt with. And yet they passed up, apparently, according to Binance themselves, the opportunity for a settlement to instead take it to court. And as was mentioned here, both this case and the CFTC case discuss behavior which is potentially criminal. We've known for months now that supposedly Western Washington prosecutors were ready to indict but were held up by MLARs. The fact that the SEC chose not to settle makes me less confident than I was before that they'll get the deferred prosecution I've suggested in the past. I am increasingly convinced that we are going to see like actual indictments without a negotiated uh, deferred prosecution against Cheng Pen Zhao and against Binance for criminal behavior. We don't know that's going to happen, obviously, but we know that prosecutors have been ready to do that for months. And the fact that these agencies were willing to go ahead, despite the entity itself claiming it was willing to settle, suggests to me we have reached some kind of tipping point in terms of political will or desire to go after this type of actor. Yeah. Yeah. And it's easy to find himself in a, a uniquely bad position, right? Because 
FTX collapsing puts a lot of heat on the industry to begin with. He's the only big actor left who's engaging in things that are, you know, questionable to say the least. Um, I mean, there's a lot of other people doing things that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of other people, but I'm saying he's the he's the biggest fish left, right? Um, and he clearly I mean, had an, a hand in the death of FTX. I know an $80 billion dollar fish that's just sitting there if anyone wants to take a well, look that's, at it. That, those guys will never go down. That's the perfect Ponzi. You can't beat them. So you have to go after the people you can beat, right? Like, Tether will survive. We all know that. You'll never get them. Uh, but you know, so, so he has that problem going for him. And then at the same time, he has the anti uh, Chinese government set, sen- sentiment that's like building and building in Washington for the last couple of years and Binance is viewed as a Chinese entity. So it's like a combination of the worst two things that could happen at the same time. So I'm not surprised that there's suddenly willpower or the political will to, uh, you know, throw the book at somebody. It's going to be him for what it's worth. I don't think. Binance is a Chinese entity. Well, I don't entity. think necessarily think either. It's a, it has no borders, of, of right? That. But it's perceived that way, and that's all that matters. Well, and, like, there are a lot of... For sure. No, I, I totally get... Like, there yeah. are a lot of directors and stuff for Binance entities with addresses in China. Like, I, I remember when I was looking at Binance Australia for one of my recent uh, newsletter ish, ep- issues, like, both of the entities they used had multiple people who had their address, like, in China and were the directors for these Binance entities. So there's definitely more substantial Chinese links than Cheng Penzao will admit to. But I agree that the company is not like uniquely Chinese or like is acting with some approval of the Chinese state, at least no more than any company operating in China is. Yeah. And there, I don't think there's many Chinese nationals using Binance for what it's worth again. But anyway, um, I, I, I do, I want to get into, uh, the other, uh, kind of incredible thing that happened today. And the, and the reason I want to get into that, um, which is it's uh, Coinbase, in case anyone has not been paying attention, um, it is that the SEC is coming after Coinbase as well, um, which is like, you know, these are two major exchanges in two days. Um, and I, I just first of all want to address, I think a lot of people are suggesting that like this proves that Operation Choke Point 2.0 was a real thing and that and here here's proof. And I, and the, the only thing I want to say about that is to me, it's very clear that FTX was the spark that F- as soon as the SEC and the CFTC and regulators in general were embarrassed by how horribly they would played their hands when it came to FTX and Sam Bankman Freed. Um, and politicians for that matter as well, and how embarrassing that was, everybody got fire under their ass and started doing things. So I'm not surprised that they're doing that they're bringing these actions. And I don't think it's proof of some broader conspiracy. However, there was also a a clearly coordinated state prosecution move today as well. And so I'd like we should get into all of this. Again, I don't know who wants to start this round, but please uh, have at it. Let's just start with let's start with the the lawsuit itself. What the SEC is saying here. So I understand it as the SEC is saying a few things, right? It's saying that Coinbase is operating as a securities exchange, which they never registered as. That they're engaging in the sale and uh, uh, facilitating the sale of a variety of securities which are not registered as such. And then they're also offering securities products in the form of their staking services. I think that's the that's like the three main parts of the complaint. Um, and we we knew this was all coming for a, a long time, given that the SEC's already said a lot of these things were at, uh, securities. They've already claimed that staking was a security, and you know companies have actually already settled charges based on that. Um, so we knew this was coming for months. The fact that it took so long for the market to recognize that is fascinating. Yeah, I think that's actually a really good point to highlight here is like this was at this point kind of inevitable. They've settled with Kraken over their staking program. They brought a suit against Ishan Wahi, the former Coinbase product manager, in which they allege several of these tokens are securities. After you've done those two things, failing to sue Coinbase would have been seen as peculiar. And I think that we should probably, like, draw a delineation at this point and say the Binance suit suggests mishandling of customer assets in a way that the Coinbase suit currently does not. The Coinbase suit suggests Coinbase is operating as an unregistered exchange, as you mentioned, clearinghouse, broker-dealer, etc., with a ton of unregistered securities on it, which is crazy because Paul told me they never list securities, end of story, period. But... 
they seem to disagree with the SEC on that matter. But like there's a fundamental difference between like operating an unlicensed securities exchange and misappropriating customer assets, right? And so we should draw that distinction now before we get deeper into like what Coinbase was allegedly doing. Yeah, my favorite thing is seeing that Coinbase is defending themselves essentially in their in I believe it was uh, Armstrong's tweet in response was that hey guys we're only probably engaging in some securities violations. We're not doing anything more serious than that. So why does anybody care is basically what he's saying. Um, one thing that's really bothered me throughout this whole thing is that uh, Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase and his his legal team as well, have really intentionally misrepresented certain aspects of uh, the SEC processes, claiming that because they were allowed to go public, somehow that meant that the SEC had approved their business model and that everything was was hunky dory, and that's totally unfair that they're coming back now. It's amazing for them to do that because it's totally false. The S one does not approving that has nothing to do with them approving the business model, right? Um, secondly, in the S one filing, which I and many other people have pointed out because it's right there, Coinbase admits that hey, at some point they might say these are all securities, and then we might be out of business. They basically say that right in their filing, right? And now they're saying, well, geez, we didn't see this coming, guys. It's not fair. They saw it coming. They knew exactly what was going to happen. This was actually a point that I ended up making in um, two episodes ago for us when we were at Consensus and talking about it. Like I had a whole rant because Paul Greywalt tried to make this same point when he was speaking at Consensus. They let us go public. They knew what our business model was. So clearly they approved of our business model. And like the, the Securities Act itself specifically says that like – the SEC allowing these things to go into effect does not serve as an endorsement and should not be inter- and should not be represented that way. It emphasizes. And so I agree. That's been really painful to see. The other thing I wanted to emphasize is that Coinbase's business model has fundamentally changed since they IPO'd. They've started listing vastly more tokens. Pre-IPO, even Dogecoin wasn't on Coinbase. And now Dogecoin would be seen as like an upper quartile coin (laughs) on Coinbase. Like they fundamentally changed the type of asset they listed from when the S1 was approved until now. Can I, can I just, uh, do you know how many assets were listed pre-IPO? I know like Tether had been listed bef- like the day of IPO, like the day before IPO or something like very briefly before. I thought it was like day before. after something much more suspicious. I, I think it was right before, but either way. Um, it, that would be like, an interesting thing to just graph that out, like how many assets they had before and after. That would I'd, be interesting. I would love to know <laughs> how, how much it's increased. And I would also love to know how many of the assets they're suggesting are securities because they specifically said, what What did they say in the lawsuit? Was it uh, 2018 or 2019 that the lawsuit starts? I, I'd have to look back. I don't Yeah, remember. I don't remember. If, uh, 2019, I, it was 2018, I believe. I oh, okay. Um, <laughs> That, but like, that's a crazy I, I late it's, date for the for the lawsuit to start, in my humble opinion. Like, I, it's just it's just interesting that it didn't in start before that. 2014 or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Well, maybe they were playing it safe until they got they went public, and then they just went for it because they already but cashed then, out. So this is this, and here I, I want to play devil's advocate here because I, like if the suggestion is that the SEC is here to protect the consumer, then isn't there an issue with letting, like if you're going to let them go public and you know that they're listing unregistered securities and you know that that's their business model, like are you protecting consumers really? Or are you just kind of waiting for them to grow big enough for you to get your cream off the top? I mean, we talked about this back in our Fuck the SEC episode, right? Is that the SEC by its very nature is a disclosure and enforcement regime in that they try to make sure that your disclosures are appropriate and then enforce when they think there's a violation. I think that there's definitely an argument to be made that many of these enforcements could have and would have benefited from being brought sooner. But like we've talked about broadly, there has not been any kind of political desire to go after cryptocurrency in that way. And it hasn't really been until first Luna and Terra and then FTX and Alameda Research that we've really seen like politicians and regulators really engage in that kind of way with a desire to potentially disrupt these types of things. And like we've alluded to in the past here, like there's some really perverse incentives around that where it can be seen as very negative to go after something new because you're going after innovation. Why do you hate innovation, Cass? 
Yeah, I mean, I know, I know. The Bermuda, Bermuda loves innovation. The Bahamas love innovation. Uh, Malta, just a, a host of very interesting countries and tax havens really love innovation. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, uh, I, d- <laughs> we both, uh, Bennett, you and I covered the, there was a subcommittee hearing today. Um, and Paul Grewal. It was the, a full committee um, hearing. Or a full, full committee, committee hearing, hearing. right. Yeah. Didn't seem like it. Anyway, um, Paul Grewal was there. That's That's where he was today. While uh, Gary Gensler was on squ- uh, Squawk Box or some- something, Greewall Greewall went there to basically suggest that the draft they the new digital asset law bill the uh, draft that they were looking into was a uh, much better than what we currently have, and the argument continually seemed to be that a lot more a lot more of the regulatory burden should be placed on the CFTC. And less so on the SEC. And everyone was suggested, like, they had a bunch of former people involved with the CFTC, former chairs and former people involved. And all of them were suggesting that that this was a great draft and a great bill. And then Berkowitz, who is the only one who's currently working there, uh, was like, no, no, please, no. Like, repeatedly saying, no, I don't think the CFTC can handle protection of retail consumers. We we can't do that. That's not why we were created. Um, and it's just interesting to see Greewall, Coinbase, all of these guys making um, making a, a, a real push right now while simultaneously playing this weird bully role of saying, like, we're already one foot out the door. We're heading to Bermuda. Um, but also we're still publicly listed. It's business as usual, but also like it, it just, all of it feels so convoluted and the straits seem so tumultuous right now. I don't know. Like what, what are you guys thinking this means for Coinbase longer term? I mean, you can think of their strategy as, uh, somebody like with a dam in front of them that starts popping holes and water starts spewing out of it and they start sticking things in it to try to keep the water from rushing out and destroying the dam. Like that's what they're doing, right? They're trying to put out all the fires at once and they can't do it. Um, so, yeah, it's obvious. I mean, the strategy doesn't make any sense because there is no strategy, right? They're just reacting as things happen to them, which is really inexcusable because they should have seen all these problems coming a long time ago. And I'm sure they knew these problems were coming. And yet it doesn't seem like they did much to prepare for them except try and spin stories that don't have any kind of legal basis. Um, you know, the only concern I have is that, you know, as we saw with Sam Bankman fried a lot of people will take money in Washington regardless of where you're getting it from. And um, my concern would be that they buy enough people to subvert our government and achieve, you know, the destruction of securities laws that took, you know, basically the Great Depression to be enforced, like be created and like have been effective in a lot, in a lot of ways in protecting consumers for a long time. Um, But I mean, no, if, if the, if the SEC suit goes through, then Coinbase ceases to exist as we know it. There's no question about that. I think that what's, especially interesting in all this is um rust and benham because i did more of the first half of the hearing and you did more of the second half did suggest that the cftc could handle an expansion into the digital commodity spot supervision thing but then order to do that it was going to be essential to expand the budget of the cftc by tens of millions of dollars a year and like the I think the last appropriations budget that the GOP suggested cut the CFTC budget. So, like, even in theory, if the CFTC could expand in the same way they did to supervise the swap markets, there doesn't seem to be a willingness to actually invest to make them prepared for that kind of thing. And the... The suggestion I heard was $120 million over three years. Um, and $40 million per year. Also... Also, that Berkowitz was like pretty staunch in his suggestion that like altering these securities laws drastically is just going to create well, yeah. a burden and chaos, you know? Well, and, and that's like the other thing is when we get into this is like the uh, Thompson McHenry Johnson, some other generic name proposal that's been f- put forward does like create this new SRO. But it kind of like dances around the issue of what's a security and what's a commodity and doesn't actually provide any new clarity on that in a way where it still falls that like anything the SEC says is a security 
ends up mostly being a security. And so it doesn't really change that much except for the creation of this new, like, SRO partially funded by the crypto industry where the CFTC and the SEC are supposed to collaborate. It's mostly... It's performative, right? It's performative in the same way we always discuss these hearings and these bills as. Like, it's not really a serious proposal to deal with digital assets in the United States. It looks like a serious proposal, right? We're going to create a self-regulatory organization that's self-funding, and we're going to promote regulator collaboration. Sounds like a really good idea until you look at the appropriations budget and realize that you're not funding those agencies, right? You're just creating another task. You expect them to complete on even less money than they had in the year in which they failed to deal with these issues, right? It, it's not a meaningful advancement of anything. But if you're, if you're Coinbase yeah. or you're Binance... It's a great, it's the perfect, the best of both worlds, right? Like you take the, take the uh, rulemaking and enforcement out of the hands of the people that can do it. You put them in the hands of people who can't, and then you starve them of funds. So there's no way they can ever even catch up. That's perfect. There, there'll never be any enforcement. Well, and like as that's what they want. Well, yeah, and like as you mentioned, the the CFTC there is distinct from the SEC and many other financial regulators in that it does not have any self funding mechanism. Any money they make from fines and stuff goes straight back to the general treasury, and they depend on the appropriations for their budget every single year when no their self-funding mechanism and so like putting things in the hand of the cftc if you think you're going to be able to gain political powers and other avenues gives you a way to potentially then like you mentioned defund the cftc and like i think broadly we're getting back to kind of the same reason that sam bankman freed with his support of dccpa and more broadly wanted the cftc as the primary regulator is that they are currently under resourced to deal with it and it is unlikely that they're going to be able to get the resources to deal with it. And so the idea is you're picking the least resource regulator so that you are as limited in the regulations you have to endure as possible. So this I, we're talking about limited resources here, and I and this leads me to another devil's advocate question in regard to the SEC and what they did with Binance and Coinbase, right? And this idea that they mentioned, I don't know how many it was, was it 13, 18, something like that, um, different tokens specifically as securities, right? Um, why aren't they going after those tokens as opposed to Coinbase and Binance? Like, why wouldn't you try to take on, if those are easy to attack unregistered securities, clearly, then why aren't you doing anything about it? Mm. I mean, I think they aren't easy to go after, right? Like there's not, like the organizations behind them are even more amorphous in a lot of cases than, you know, a publicly traded company or even Binance. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that these exchanges are how customers access them. So you have to cut, if you, if you want to actually protect consumers, you have to prevent consumers from being able to be scammed, right? So you have to cut them off at the source, which is actually the exchanges. But I, I mean, that's, that would be my assumption. Also, they have the exchanges have the money that can pay the fines, whereas the token people don't. That was going to be my leading point, is that many yeah. of the cryptocurrency unregistered securities are currently broke. And that even if you do want to go after them specifically, like we've seen in the XRP case, that is potentially an expensive and time-consuming litigation, where at best you levy a fine and make it uncomfortable for exchanges to list it. You want to make it uncomfortable for exchanges to list it, as Mike alluded to. Go after the exchanges. Um, yeah, I think I think my last and, devil's and, ad. Sorry, but before you get onto that, I think, and we've talked about this before. Like the SEC is not some perfect good faith arbiter who acts on like each case in some hypothetical version of like what the law is and what that means in all these cases, and we're going to go after as many people as possible who are breaking the law. They pretend they're not, but the SEC, along with all of these other executive appointed regulators, are political organizations and their leaders are, at least in some sense, politicians looking for their own advancement, right? And so all of their decisions are kind of mediated through that framework. So they are going to pick the cases where they think it is going to benefit them the most. And that's bad. And we should do things to fix that. But it's also an important thing to acknowledge when we're dealing pragmatically with the reality of what the SEC is. Yeah, it's funny. I just remembered that a library, LBRY, had settled with or not settled. I don't even know what happened, but they had lost to the SEC and, and owed 
I don't know what it was, 20 million or something, like some not crazy number, but large number. And now it's been knocked down to something like $100,000 because they are absolutely penniless. Um, so I like y- you make a good point that like if they're trying to levy fines and penalties, the reality is most of these <clears throat> most of these coins, the operators will go broke fighting um, instead of <laughs> instead of uh, trying to. Um, yeah, trying to like let let things play out the way they they will. You know what we haven't we haven't discussed the um, coordinated uh, state state prosecutor move. Oh. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's get into that. I mean, it doesn't really seem that shocking to me, right? It's kind of like what we saw in the uh, when they finally went after Celsius, right? Is a bunch of the states all filed like simultaneous orders saying, uh, "Hey, if if you're violating federal laws, you're probably violating our laws too." And so a bunch of states did that. What? Alabama, California, Illinois, Kentucky, Maryland, Vermont, New Jersey, South Carolina, Washington, and Wisconsin. Uh, So, yeah. I mean, all of those states have issued their show cause orders, which means Coinbase has like a month, four weeks or something to explain why they're not selling unregistered securities in each of these states. Which is just a lot more paperwork for Coinbase to deal with. But Paul's got a good team, I'm sure. I mean, this is why I'm like, I'm curious if we, I love think, the, if we... Uh, I just, I just love the assault, like the, the assertion by the crypto folks that uh, there's a conspiracy because these things got filed on the same day. It's like these guys talk to each other, believe it or not, the regulators from states and the federal government talk to each other because they're part of like the same kind of system. So it's not really all that surprising that, you know, these things could be filed at the same time, but yeah, yeah. The conspiracy theories are a little out of hand at this point, um, but it doesn't i mean this doesn't help necessarily that all, all of these things are happening at once i do in my heart of hearts believe that this is like pure embarrassment after ftx and and all the escapades of last year um that there's little like you don't the government doesn't ever do things in a like any kind of efficient coordinated way like coordination insofar as they talk to each other a little bit i like yeah I, there is no there is no conspiracy theory needed here um but yeah there is a lot going on and i do think you're you're right uh to suggest that perhaps this changes coinbase's business model forever i'm also i i think everybody is on the edge of their seats about what this means for binance cuz it either means not that much possibly or it means a lot. There's criminal charges eventually involved. Um, so I, 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 I don't know. Yeah. Any, any other? Uh, what other? What other craziness uh, has? Ha- have I forgotten some stuff here? Yes. Well, our favorite shadow banker got sentenced to six years in prison. Uh, so on Monday, the same day this Binance case dropped, the months delayed sentencing of Reginald Fowler, one of the principals of Crypto Capital Corps, episode six, I want to say, five maybe, uh, was sentenced to six years in prison for wire fraud, operating an unlicensed money transmitter and a bunch of other stuff. At the last second, the uh, U.S. attorney tried to get some of the counterfeiting stuff that the FBI agents had mentioned in there, which... Cass, I got to ask you now, this is this might not make the actual podcast, but did you know that Reggie was caught in 2016 at the Canadian border with counterfeiting stuff? I knew the 2019 time he got no. caught when it was at his house, but I didn't know the 2016 time. Do you remember there was an, a, a Twitter account that posted a bunch of paragraphs from a book that some other person had written and that had mentioned Reginald Fowler and this car wash business that they had started with Reggie um, and how this car wash business had gone totally sour, like incredibly fast and how Reggie had like fucked him out of this multi-million dollar um, car wash business. But I'm just curious if that was like the same time period, this 2016 like shady, weird stuff going on. I I can't believe he wasn't even charged for it. like I'm it's blows my mind that you could be caught counterfeiting money and they're like, eh, we'll just charge you with some other stuff. And See, go. that's the thing. He wasn't ca- caught counterfeiting. He was caught with some, but not all of the supplies necessary for counterfeiting and with counterfeit bills. I guess that's that's reasonable, reasonable doubt. I, 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 I don't know. Um, yeah, but I, yeah, he's um, spending six years in prison. Well, that's a lot to, less than he was originally going to be facing, isn't it? It is and it isn't. His defense wanted basically time served plus a few weeks. 
Um, and like under the sentencing guidelines, I think he was eligible for like, depending on how you interpreted it, up to like 12, I want to say. So this is maybe on the little bit shorter end, but it's really among white collar criminals and stuff like that. A six year sentence is pretty substantial. And we can talk about what that means for white collar prosecutions when you can misappropriate <laughs> over a billion dollars. And a six year sentence seems pretty substantial. But that's like a broader societal issue rather than like a Reggie Fowler issue, you know? Well, I just found out. So this is a federal. Was this a federal prosecution, or was or or not? Like I yeah. know that that for yes. uh, for Liz, uh, for for Elizabeth Holmes, for Liz Holmes, um, the mom and uh, and lady that is you know only doing good in the world. Um, I I know that she she's, she fought a she's bear. There for, it, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> she she's facing 11 years now. Right. But then someone said, like, oh, she'll get a, a ton of time off for good behavior. But it turns out yeah, that in federal prison, for federal in federal prison, you have to you have to do 85 percent of your of your sentence. So I guess even for for good behavior, Reggie is facing what then five five plus years uh, in in prison. So yeah, I mean that's that sucks. Can I say one thing while we're here? Is uh, do you think this is going to mean anything for other cryptocurrency exchange tokens like Binance, Binance token BNB is the one that's in the crosshairs of the SEC? It seems like. FTT kind of propped up FTX, and that might be why they're going after BNB. I'm curious if, like, these other exchange tokens are going to get fucked too, or if they don't even matter enough to to for the SEC to chase them I down. don't think they matter enough. Yeah, because, I mean, like, which, like, so OKX is pretty big. They don't really operate in the U.S. I mean, I, there's OKCoin or whatever. They I know they have a U.S. branch, but, like, I don't know how split up that is. Like, most of those they are have- not... They have one. The, Wobi has a token. Bitmex right. has a token. I mean, token. they all have one, but it's like, yeah, yeah, they all have one. But I just don't know. Like, I, I, I mean, they should. Yeah, they should. But like, well, they. I don't know. I mean, OKX, like that one is so. You can look at it on chain. It's like it's all held in uh, fake wallets. Like, there's like no real interest in that token, despite it being one of the biggest in the market. Like, all those things are totally faked. Um, but I don't know. I mean. Tether, right? Why the f- why haven't they gotten Tether yet? I don't understand it. I mean, is the there Reggie a wholly thing, legitimate it like... business, Mike? <laughs> they're the they good guys to, in they refer... crypto. They're they're they're, they they're investing billions of dollars in renewable energy production when they've got two hundred million in cash on hand. They've don't ask me to explain never that math. I refuse trade. to explain they that never... math. Yeah. They've never made a bad trade in their history. It's like they are the best traders in the world and they're only doing good for, for the planet. I mean, they're humanitarians if we're trying to. If I mean, we they're wanna... basically the real version of Sam Bankman Fried. Right? <laughs> yeah. The honest version. Tether, the world's best effective altruists. Yeah, exchange tokens the are most, fucked. Um, there is the one little thing I want to add company. that has a tiny Binance link, so I feel justified throwing it in. Protos had some interesting reporting about Wire. A. A uh, payment processor mm-hmm. who we talked about, brief- who I talked about briefly in a couple of the non-podcast videos on our YouTube channel. Wire is a cryptocurrency payments processor that it seems like Binance US is now using. Wire also currently has their uh, their entity in the European Union that their terms of service tell people to go to is one Yred OU out of Estonia. It's currently in liquidation and is controlled by a fraudster. Their entity in the UK, which is still referenced in their policy, is currently dissolved and has been for over a month, but is still listed in their policy. They said their CEO stepped down in January. Their annual reports they filed in February for their primary corporation. That one is still active, believe it or not, still lists the CEO who supposedly stepped down. So they're in some type of disarray, well, they're currently seeming to serve Binance US. So, uh, yeah, I think there's still a few other payment processors and other bad actors in the cryptocurrency ecosystem who are going to find that as the tide continues to go out, they're going to be um, in more and more precarious positions. Yeah. For me, that the most one of the most interesting parts of this whole thing that I've learned about is the payment processor aspect of the industry and and more broadly just how these companies function in what they're doing is it's just fascinating how dirty they all are it's all these like prepaid debit cards everybody's doing prepaid debit cards it's just crazy 
and the amount of money these guys are moving is insane. You know, and it's like, um, which one was the one that uh, uh, Rails Bank? Did you hear of them? Railser? I don't think they so. Were, uh, they were the, yeah, they were a UK based one that they were valued at a billion dollars. They, they took over. It's not even like you can make this shit up. They literally had taken over Wirecard's prepaid debit card business in the UK and then proceeded to do the exact same business model where they were creating, they were servicing all of these like DeFi crypto things that had like crypto based prepaid debit cards and, and stuff like that. Um, and they, they, just, they just went insolvent recently. I, I never wrote the article about that, but there's, there's a ton of them. It just became public that they were insolvent is what I believe you mean. Uh, oh, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that is still one of the craziest things. And, like, there's – I go down that path every so often, and just eventually you reach some out-of-date, like, WordPress form website for this entity that is – clearly connected to everything else but that is also clearly not being updated and you're like oh so someone bought something and we're not getting any further without a subpoena i hit that dead end a lot when i start digging into payment processors or you look and like right before it became a payment processor the corporate entity was doing forex trading they're always forex traders right before they become uh payment processors it's really fascinating as a i mean and just like the little pieces that connect the, the binary options people to crypto, right? Like uh, Bybit CEO is a former binary options executive, right? FTX is European operations being based off of a binary options operation, right? Uh, all these guys, it's, it's amazing. Or, or, F, or Celsius, for God's sake. I mean, the ties there are just insane. It's amazing. Yeah. They all transitioned over to crypto. Do, do you know the name of Binance Australia Derivatives corporate entity before Binance took it over and converted it into their and converted it into what is now Azure's yeah, what, trading? It's called Easy Capital. That sounds that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Capital's always easy. That's what I say. <laughs> oh my god. It's amazing though. Yeah. Well, we'll never 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 run yeah. out of things to talk okay. about. Um you got well, anything else? Yeah. Uh I I I no, I mean, I think I think that it just about covers it. Um, I can only assume that by the time we release this, even if it's tomorrow, it's going to be an entirely different <laughs> world um, and that some other horrible news for the industry will be coming out. Um, whatever that may be, I guess we'll be discussing it soon. Um, and I hope that this is even still relevant by the time uh yeah, by the time well, it comes I'm, out. I'm holding yeah. out hope Thank that, you for joining that this us. is like the week of enforcement and every day is a new thing. I, that's what I hope. You know, Monday through Friday, they just keep hammering at them. But we'll see. Yeah, because you have no professional obligation to cover it. You can just watch it if you want. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I've read so many dozens of pages of SEC bullshit over the last two days. <laughs> you like it. Don't you lie. Fine, fine. And... I, I just, before we sign off, want to say thank you, Mike, for spending your time with us. And Cascoin has not been named a security by the SEC, will not be named a security by the SEC, and cannot be named a security by the SEC because we say it's not a security. If it was a security, we would tell you and then you wouldn't invest in it. But it's not a security and never will be. And that's what you must remember. <laughs> <laughs>